Ethiopia is known for being the source of delicious coffee and a state in Africa that resisted colonization for an awe-inspiring amount of time. It's a Christian country that rejected both sides of the Great Schism and developed into its own very unique religion. Their royal family claimed a bloodline back to King Solomon, so sit back and enjoy this brief history of Ethiopia. Hi, I'm Tristan Johnson, and this is Step Back History. Be sure to click the subscribe button as well as the bell notification to never miss a new Step Back video or live stream. Ethiopia is a country located here in a region called the Horn of Africa. It's very tropical, and since 1993, Ethiopia has been landlocked. We'll get into why a bit later, but first, let's go back, maybe as far back as we've ever gone on Step Back, to the first Ethiopians. There have been people in Ethiopia going so ridiculously far back that we weren't even humans. The oldest fossil of a hominid in Ethiopia is a specimen of an Australopithecus afarensis that archaeologists estimate to be between 2.9 and 3.4 million years old. The language groups in the region split off from their linguistic roots about 8 to 10,000 years ago. The first sign of farming for cereal grains with plows shows up around 5,000 years ago, probably coming south from Sudan. Around the 7th century CE, we see the first kingdom in Ethiopia called Dumt. They made their fortunes by trading in objects like gold and silver, as well as many peoples and things that would be less than thrilled to talk about country exporting today. This includes ivory, tortoise shells, rhinoceros horns, and slaves. Their primary customers were the traders from the Southern Arabian Peninsula, which would be modern-day Yemen. This kingdom declined in 300 BCE, replaced with city-states. These city-states then unified under the power of the state of Aksum. Again, Ethiopia thrives because of its location as a central point of trade between Sudan with the Nile River to the north, Sub-Saharan Africa to the south, and the Arabian Peninsula via the sea. Aksum owed a lot of its culture to influence from the Arabian Peninsula. They spoke a language called Ge'ez and wrote in a modified South Arabian alphabet. It also seems their spiritual world featured a blend of Arabian and local gods. This suggests a very close cultural exchange across the Red Sea, so much so that scholars used to believe that Arabian immigrants peopled northern Ethiopia in this period. But more scholars today dispute this. Nevertheless, this exchange is cemented by one of the most important legends in Ethiopian history. They believed that King Solomon, like King Solomon from the Bible, married the Queen of Sheba and produced the Emperor Menelik I, who would be the progenitor of the Ethiopian royal dynasty. They even still claim to have the Ark of the Covenant. By the 5th century CE, Aksum was the dominant power in Red Sea trade. We find lots of coins in this period minted with faces of Aksumite emperors. We even see references to their port towns in Greco-Roman texts. And it's via trade and contact with Greeks and Romans that scholars believe Christianity came to Ethiopia around the 5th century CE. Monks came to Ethiopia to preach, and eventually founded the Ethiopian Church. Like the Coptic Christians, when deciding between allegiance with Rome and the early Catholics, or Constantinople and the early Orthodox Christians, the Ethiopians chose none of the above. They broke with both churches, and did not resume relations with them until the mid-20th century. Aksum grew to such an extent that it had several suzerain kingdoms under its thumb, even across the Red Sea in southern Arabia. They extended their power and even sent Ethiopian troops as far as Yemen to ensure it. This would end when Christianity began to disappear in southern Arabia due to a Persian invasion and an Arab attack shortly after that. The rise of Islam in Arabia sealed the deal. This actually had the effect of cutting off Ethiopia from Mediterranean trade, which meant their contact with Europe and the Middle East was shut off. Aksum began to decay without Mediterranean trade. It responded by focusing on land-based conquests, pushing south into fertile land there. With them also came the Ethiopian church. A minor lord was able to overturn the Aksumite dynasty, called the Zagwe dynasty. They initially got flack for not being the descendants of King Solomon, but made up for it by building several beautiful churches out of rock faces. That being said, they never had complete control over Ethiopia. People always pointed out that they didn't have that King Solomon charm. 
This boiled over when in 1270 a different noble rebelled. This noble did some jiggery pokery and was able to claim heritage to King Solomon, which made many factions prefer his reign. He had to publish his long-form genealogy, but eventually his legitimacy was secured. The legend of Menelik I, the Solomon dynasty, Semitic culture, and their language would become the basis for Ethiopian national unity. It was also around this time that the Ethiopians found themselves in constant conflict with the spread of Islam. On the edges of the Ethiopian empire, Islam was spreading and converted a lot of people. By the 13th century, various new sultan neighbors unified. At this time, Ethiopia was fighting on all sides and trying to hang on to the land that they could conquer. They even decided to put tariffs on goods going to the newly unified Muslim region, which resulted in pushback. This resulted in a colossal war when those unified Muslim territories fell to the sultans of Adal and their leader Ahmad ibn Ibrahim al-Ghazi. He declared holy war on the Ethiopians and invaded. It looked like the Ethiopians would lose too until in 1541 the Portuguese showed up to give them muskets. It quickly turned the tide of the war, but there was a catch. After the mass apostasy to Islam, they now had to deal with Catholic missionaries. Jesuits came over with the Portuguese on a mission to bring the Ethiopians into the Catholic Church. More religious turmoil occurred over theological debates. An Ethiopian emperor needed to abdicate, but Catholicism was resisted with reasonable success. This turmoil eventually led to a period of feudal anarchy where the authority of the emperor was fragile. They call this the Age of Princes, and it would last until 1855. This was a pretty rough time for the average Ethiopian. Think the time when the shoguns of Japan fought each other for power. The Age of Princes ended when Kasa, one of those rulers, managed to unify Ethiopia again, crowning himself Emperor Twodros II. This would be the foundation of the modern country of Ethiopia. He attempted during his reign to enact many social reforms and consolidate his power. This both overtaxed the citizens of the country and angered the nobles, so another rebellion picked up. He also tried to reach out to Queen Victoria to destroy the Islamic religion. The British ignored this, and in anger, Twodros II imprisoned the British envoy. This led to a British invasion, not the fun kind, and to avoid capture, the emperor committed suicide. It was around this time that Europeans were beginning to take an extreme interest in conquering Africa, oppressing its people, and ransacking its resources. The next two successors to Twodros had to fight Egyptians and resist attempts from Italy to get a foothold in the region. This includes an attempt by Italy to turn Ethiopia into a protectorate just by writing it into their translation of an agreement between the two countries. The Victorian age Italians believed that with their superior European blood or whatever weird race science they bought into would let them defeat Ethiopia without trying very hard. The Italians were decimated when they attempted to do so in 1896. This was also when Ethiopia quickly modernized, getting communication networks, railroads, and systems of schools and hospitals. And this brings us to 1916 and the beginning of the most influential emperor of Ethiopia, the one that you've likely heard of and I've spoken about on this channel ages ago, Haile Selassie I. His birth name was Rastafari, and began work as a regent for his female family member who held the crown, Zodito. He engineered Ethiopia's entrance into the League of Nations, believing heavily in the idea of collective security. He abolished slavery and hired some key advisors to modernize the government bureaucracy. By the time Zodito named him king in 1928, Ethiopia was booming from the exportation of coffee. This success came at a terrible cost, however. Benito Mussolini, the fascist leader of Italy, took Ethiopia's growing power as a sign he needed to invade them before they could be a real challenge. When the Italians invaded, Haile Selassie believed that the collective security of the League of Nations would come to his aid. When that League of Nations decided not to help out, Ethiopia had to fight alone in a seven-month war against the Italians. Their superior air power and use of poison gas gave the Italians the upper hand, and Haile Selassie had to go into exile. The Italians occupied Ethiopia from 1936 to 1941. During that time, Ethiopian resistance fighters struggled against their Italian occupiers. In 1940, Italy entered into the Second World War proper, 
And with that, the British declared Haile Selassie I their full ally. With the help of the British, Haile Selassie was able to mobilize an Ethiopian military in Sudan and quickly defeated the Italians. They retook the capital at Addis Ababa in five months and reestablished the Ethiopian government. Throughout the 50s, he used support from the United States and the global community to reform government, to become much more democratic, but still a monarchy. However, his reluctance to give up power led to inefficiencies and slow modernization. Haile Selassie began to become less popular. Ethiopians started to feel that their only way forward would be to dump the monarchy. In 1960, there was an attempted coup, but he didn't take the hint. When Somalia got independence that same year, Somali nationalists began to fight the government with support from Moscow. So in true proxy war fashion, the Ethiopians got some help from the United States. The situation would just get worse. Eritreans began to rebel, bringing in a variety of minority groups to their cause. A student movement in the 60s grew in popularity and became more radical as the decade progressed. They considered Haile Selassie an agent of US imperialism, which isn't an entirely inaccurate statement. By the 70s, the Ethiopian army was maxed out fighting rebels all around the country. In 1974, several junior military officers mutinied. Combined, this conflict, drought, and the subsequent famine in 1974 sent Ethiopia into crisis mode. The military mutineers turned into a military resistance and overthrew Haile Selassie, who was very old and senile in September. This new provisional military government was full of power struggles, infighting, and overwhelming tension. Ethiopia went through three leaders between September and December of 1974. It eventually resolved with a takeover by a military leader named Teferi Banti, who declared on December 20th, 1974, that Ethiopia was going to be socialist. The proxy war reversed. The USSR now supported Ethiopia, and the US was now best friends with Somalia. While nationalist rebellions didn't die down, especially in Eritrea, there was now internal fighting between military groups. This campaign would continue until 1978, killing or exiling thousands of Ethiopians. As many as 100,000 died, with thousands more tortured and imprisoned. The surviving leader of this power struggle was a military leader named Mengistu Haile Mariam. From 1977 to 1991, the new socialist government of Ethiopia tried to reorganize the country under a USSR model. This was complete with famines created by brutal land reforms, implementing a command economy, and the forced movement of some 600,000 farmers. All this time, Ethiopia fought various rebel groups in a guerrilla war. In 1991, these rebel groups managed to force Mengitsu to stop his Sovietization of Ethiopia. Not long after, the rebels who had eventually organized and unified were able to advance on Addis Ababa, forcing Mengistu to flee to Zimbabwe. So, the early 90s was another period of significant government changes. This new rebel government decided to lean on the strength of Ethiopia being their national heterogeneity. They wanted to embrace the immense diversity of Ethiopia instead of one group trying to rule over all the others. This ethos runs all the way through the Ethiopian government, even today. In their constitution is the notion that Ethiopia is a nation of nations where any are free to go as they desire. Eritrea jumped on that right away, legally separating in May of 1993. Then, more troubles were to come. The government began to love censoring information, and elections started to become more and more questioned. They also took the poison pill of entering into the World Bank's Structural Adjustment Program. It's a program of loans to help countries develop, but comes with a lot of strings attached. It's left some countries like Ecuador with all of their natural resources owned by overseas companies and what little is left over unevenly distributed because of structural reforms they had to make. It leaves very little for the social services that make up the bedrock of a functioning country. The program devalued Ethiopia's currency, reduced government interference in the markets, cut civil services, and made it easier for international corporations to siphon money out of the country. In 1994, it adopted its third constitution in 40 years, and in 1995 created the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia we know today. 
It sticks out from previous Ethiopian constitutions by being focused on ethnic autonomy and devolution, or giving lots of power to local governments. It had its first multi-party election in 1995, but was boycotted by a lot of people who opposed the harassment, arrests, and censorship the government was committing. In 1998, a dispute over some land between Ethiopia and Eritrea resulted in a brief conflict. They signed a ceasefire in 2000, and the UN entered to settle the dispute. They decided to give the land over to Eritrea, angering Ethiopia, and in 2008, the UN pulled out, not resolving the issue. And finally, we come to the present. The 2000s are a time of relative stability, considering, but the accusations of government censorship and interfering in elections is still commonplace. The 2005 election led to massive protests, as most opposition parties declared it fraudulent. In 2010, they had another election that was considered better, but still had some funny business going on. And the story seemed quite similar in 2015. Ethiopia sounds like a land plagued with problems, and it certainly has more than its share, but the Ethiopian people are a marvel. Ethiopia is one of the most diverse countries on Earth, and has a beautiful array of music, clothing, mythology, and religion. It's quite amazing. Okay, new thing alert, I somewhat recently opened a new Step Back Slack server, so if you want to come and chat with other history fans, and yours truly, it, go to the link in the doobly-doo and join. Please, do it. This video was made possible by these wonderful people, as well as the rest of my patrons over at Patreon. I'd especially like to thank Don and Carrie Johnson, as well as Colbine Money, for their generosity. The theme song is by 12 Tone, and come back next time for more Step Back.